together with APN Kenya. Uh, since we have recently collaborated together, and this is the first event that we are uh, launching together. And uh, uh, apart from launching of partnership, this is a scholarship uh, launch of a scholarship program as well. On the courses that we have, uh, we this is related to the PGD, the one year course and a short course on COVID. The details will be given to you all later. So now we'll just move on to the, um, and also the slide deck will be shared with all participants after the webinar and the certificate participation certificate also. The link will be posted at the end of the, after the Q&A session. So you can download your uh, relevant certificates. Now we'll just move on to other slide. Uh, some keep housekeeping announcement for participants. Kindly mute your mic and turn off your video. Please ask question using chat box because you don't have rights to unmute yourself. Uh, so please post your questions. So those can be acknowledged during the Q&A session. Uh, we will be having two polls, one in, in the beginning and one uh, the second one in the last. So I would request all participants to please take a participate, uh, please participate. So we will know you better and it will help us to, uh, you know, plan a future uh, webinar in a better way. The webinar recordings will be available in Empower School of Health YouTube channel and APN YouTube channel. Also, um, this uh, the presentation and this webinar can be seen on the Facebook Live also because we have uh, already lived over there. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the slide deck will be shared with all and uh, you will receive the certificate of participation within 24 hours. Uh, small housekeeping announcement for speakers. Um, please turn on your camera for better engagement whenever you're speaking. Uh, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Please adhere to the webinar schedule speak speaking timeline. So we will, you know, wrap up the event in uh, as per the given schedule. The webinar objective to outline the need to invest in competency development for pharmacists and pharmacy profession in Africa, to spotlight the available venues and opportunity for competency development for pharmacy professions in Africa, to launch the partnership between APN and Empower School of Health. And APN, as you all know, African Pharmaceutical Network. This is the agenda for today. Um, so, uh, you will have a look and I would request all speakers to please uh, um, adhere the timing as mentioned earlier. Now this is the time of first poll. I would request Preksha to please uh, launch the poll and I would request all participants to please take a part on this poll. These are just generic questions. The first question, what is your gender? What is your age? What is your geographical region? Then uh, what is your academic background? How many years of experience do you have? So you just need to select the option that is available in front of the question and then submit your survey. And at the end, I'll just share the, uh, the results of this poll. So we all know that what exactly the percentage of uh, questions and you know, uh, the, so we will know that uh, what exactly is our uh, participants for the today webinar. As you can see, 62% are male, 40% now it's, it's keep fluctuating. So it means the participants, they are uh, selecting the respective answers. We will just wait for another few seconds, then we will end this poll and we will launch the results. I would request all the members to please uh, complete the poll questions so that we can have a better understanding. Thank you. Sixty percent of participants they have participated in the poll, so it means forty percent are still there. I would request all to please select the respective answers or the options.
I think this is time to end the poll. As you can see, 58% uh, uh, are male, 38% uh, female. Um, then the age, you can see the maximum are, uh, uh, you know, uh, up till 30. And geographical region, obviously, Kenya and Southern Africa. Then uh, the profession, um, sorry, the academic background, pharmacy bachelor degree. And we have majorly uh, participants who have more than five years of experience. That's really great. And thank you so much for your participation. Now we'll just move on to another slide. Now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. David, who is a curator from Africa uh, Pharmaceutical Network, APN, and he's the moderator for today's session. I would request uh, Dr. David to please briefly introduce yourself and then you can take it further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. And thank you everyone for being part of this session. It's a pleasure to have you all and to look at what we're going to discuss today in this session. And as been mentioned, the agenda Sonia has taken us through, we're going to look at the main topic of discussion on reimagining pharmacy global health pharmacy in Africa through competency development. And one of the key things that we're looking at is how do we build the capacity of our pharmacists and pharmacy professionals to ensure we are able to respond to the needs of global health challenges that we are having. For example, currently we're having COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the key requirements? How do we build capacities? And at the end of the day, what platforms and what initiatives are in place to ensure that we're able to achieve that? So we can move to the next slide. So in terms of the introductory component of it, we're looking at, to give you an idea, Africa Pharmaceutical Network is a network that came into place in 2020, July. And the focus was to bring, in, bring together stakeholders within the African pharmaceutical industry with an agenda that we could share best practices, share knowledge, look at how we can promote capacity building, that is in terms of trainings and capacity building programs. And ultimately, how do we stimulate innovative components and ideas within the African ecosystem to ensure that we have resilient and reliable pharmaceutical supply chains and models within the African continent that are able to serve the needs of our patients? So on that account, in terms of our engagements and looking at what capabilities do we have from other stakeholders in the ecosystem, we had a discussion with Empower School of Health. And one of the key bits that we realized that they have a capability within the capacity building as a training institution. So what if we could leverage on that and ensure that we make accessible the learning opportunities and the resources that are available on the network to our local landscape. So that would be the key aspect in terms of how we're engaging with Empower on this. And moving forward, we are hoping most of us as participants in this session, we are going to look at how do we tap into the available frameworks? What do, how do we tap into the available opportunities? So that would be the key bit for us. But as we are doing all that, the ultimate focus for us to know is as pharmacy professionals, as pharmaceutical supply chain specialists, pharmaceutical industry stakeholders, the key is to ensure that our patients in the African continent are able to access the quality pharmaceutical services and products that they need to be able to achieve positive health outcomes. So how do we make that possible? To make that possible, we need to have the skills and then we need to engage in service delivery. And that is what we're hoping at the end of this session, we'll have seen what avenues exist for us to explore and engage in. And then once we know those avenues, how do we be equipped to actually deliver on those areas? And I believe we have the best panel for this particular session that we're getting into. And I'll introduce the first guest that we have. The first guest for us is Wole Ajao, who is the marketing and portfolio head for Sub-Saharan Africa Novartis. And you know, Wole has been in practice for the last 17 years with experience in both pharmaceutical sales, marketing to general management. He leads the marketing and portfolio subfunction in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is for Novartis, as I mentioned. And he's passionate about developing and working with people and has coached, mentored a number of talents who are now in key leadership position. Currently, he's based in South Africa. And for now, I'll introduce you, Wole, to take us through your next presentation. 
Welcome, Wole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for that nice introduction. And uh, welcome everyone to the, to the webinar. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel, and uh, I hope that we'll do justice to the topic today. Uh, as I said, my name is Wole Ajami, pharmacist myself. I, I graduated 2020, and I've been in the profession for, for quite some time, of course, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I lead a marketing and portfolio function within Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm a Nigerian, I'm based in South Africa. So today, I mean, uh, being a pharmacist myself, I know the role pharmacists play within the healthcare system. Uh, we play a crucial role, but of course, our strengths have been under leverage within the pharma, uh, within the within the healthcare system. Uh, what we have done, the little we have done within Novartis, is to make sure that how do we reimagine the role of pharmacist, uh, given that our mandate today within Sub-Saharan Africa is not to leave any patient behind, and we know that in order to achieve that. A lofty idea or lofty goals, a pharmacist will be a key component of our aspiration, of course, the pharmacy channel as well. So today I will share with you why do we need to invest in, uh, in the pharmacy education and competency development. And second, we also show, I mean, share with you the baby steps we've taken uh, within Novartis to start building uh, capabilities, of course, with collaboration with like-minded stakeholders and uh, most importantly, uh, uh, pharmacy bodies to make sure that we revamp the curriculum, to make sure we revamp the competency and deliver the right solution for our pharmacists uh, in order to, to address the healthcare needs of majority of patients within Sub-Saharan Africa. The next slide. So uh, I just show this as a, as a little background to say, uh, what are the, uh, why do we really need to invest in uh, uh, competency development uh, for pharmacists. Uh, trying to pull up my screen, sorry. Okay, so uh, again, I'm sure we are familiar with these statistics that uh, uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa is home to 70% uh, of the world population, and just 3% of that of the workforce is actually available to take care of the healthcare needs of that population. But most importantly, 25% of the world disease burden is, in, is here in Africa. Then you can say, I mean, the workforce that we have to address the mongrels healthcare needs that we have. Uh, is that we uh, find new set of healthcare workers that is going to take care of this burden? Or we, we try to strengthen and uh, improve efficiency of the existing workforce uh, to make sure that they are able to deliver on this mandate and help us rebuild and um, uh, revamp our fragile healthcare system. Of course, pharmacy is going to play a key role in addressing some of these healthcare needs. And they, they, they are in a very unique position, as we all know, uh, based on our understanding and the patient journey profile we've done within Novartis, uh, you see that they represent the first point of call across multiple therapeutic areas. Uh, whether you talk about abstention, whether you talk about diabetes. At four point in time, you see that uh, a patient would definitely visit a pharmacy first, especially when you talk about community pharmacy. So the critical mass already goes there. And what do we need to do to make sure that that interaction actually uh, accounts for patients? Uh, we also know that, uh, they, as I said, they are the most accessible healthcare professional uh, within the healthcare system. And by virtue of their unique education as well and the role within the uh, healthcare system, uh, they can play a crucial role in continuity of care. We know today in number because of the challenges that we have uh, within the healthcare system, the accessibility to hospitals, to physicians is quite low. And there is easier for a, for a patient to walk into a nearby pharmacy to get the healthcare needs. Uh, as a matter of fact, a patient is likely to, uh, is, is likely, I mean, to see a pharmacist 10 times or two to 10 times uh, before uh, visiting a, a GP or a general physician uh, as the case may be. So they play a crucial role. Uh, in terms of maintaining uh, that uh, continuity of care. Continuity of care is so very important because uh, we know that uh, within our healthcare system, uh, a number of patients uh, come into the pharmacy and they don't go back to their physician. Either they come in with the expired prescriptions or that they just stay there because uh, their diseases have not escalated and they've not experienced any symptoms. How do we make sure that there is no breakdown in this continuity of care? and make sure that there is this transmission of information between pharmacists and the physicians and make sure that we improve outcomes. That's also a critical role that pharmacists play. 
So this unique approach can also help us with what you call this task shifting approach. We all know that WHO is advocating for tax shifting, uh, given that our healthcare system is more of inverted pyramid, where bulk is sitting at the top and at the, at the, at the base of the pyramid where you really need uh, the early intervention uh, to patients. You see that uh, is either the, the, the healthcare workforce at the base of pyramid are ill-equipped or they are not even sufficient. But the good news is that the patients are ready with the pharmacist. Uh, and this task shifting approach, if you keep the pharmacist effectively, they will be able to improve at the patient journey and be able to take care of this in, of patient's needs at early stage. As a matter of fact, as I said, uh, within the healthcare system in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's so fragile, we don't have the workforce. And at the end of the day, we don't have the resources to really take care of uh, advanced uh, uh, illnesses and the rest. We don't even have the capabilities, we don't even have the resources. So if we are able to take care of some of these uh, fundamental issues at the early stage, we can reduce all of this and pharmacy is gonna play a critical role. And the foundation is also to make sure that we build the capability as much as possible to be able to fulfill that mandate. But as I said, despite all this unique position and, uh, and, uh, and the key roles that pharmacists play, uh, we, we noticed that yes, the, our, our healthcare outcomes has not really improved dementiously because we've not been able to enhance the strength of the pharmacist. And as much, that, that has also impacted negatively on the outcomes, uh, on the patient outcomes that we see. Uh, currently within Sub-Saharan Africa. So our idea is to make sure that yes, what are the key area of interventions that we're looking at? One is that how do we deliver the right knowledge to the, to the, to the pharmacist to make sure that the, the, the service delivery is good and we are able to uh, uh, make sure that the intervention and the engagement with patients actually improve uh, overall outcomes. The second is yes, uh, we can provide the education. Uh, David mentioned earlier in terms of service delivery. What are the other components that we can provide the pharmacists to be able to make sure they support patient effectively through what is called the patient support programs? Because pharmacists can actually be channeled as end-to-end as -end, uh, uh, patient support programs because the patients are there anyway, and they will, either, they will visit a pharmacist, as I said, uh, almost, almost five, ten, two to five to 10 times before they go back to their physicians. How to make sure that that interaction had value to the patient and improved the journey. And most importantly, we also make sure that they have access to safe and effective medication. Uh, uh, today, uh, over-the-counter usage of medication is so high, uh, or even the prescription medicine. Uh, I was just reading, I mean, a report, I mean, yesterday, antimicrobial resistance alone is not the leading, is one of the leading cause of death. And we are the custodian of these drugs, and we are able to manage it effectively. We can, we can reduce uh, uh, these incidents and that are coming from unsafe, uh, on professional use of drugs. So those are the three key area of interventions uh, that we are definitely looking into to make sure that we're able to keep pharmacists effectively to deliver for patients and improve overall outcomes. At the end of the day, we know that to improve overall global health, uh, pharmacists need to play a critical role, especially in terms of primary health care delivery. There is no doubt about that. If you're able to strengthen the role of pharmacists at uh, that basic uh, 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 health care delivery, uh, of course, in collaboration with like-minded stakeholders, we can improve the outcomes. And the, 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 the first key point, as I said here, is to see how do we deliver the right education in collaboration with stakeholders uh, and make sure that at least we keep the pharmacists the right way to deliver on these important, uh, important, uh, important topic and outcomes. Uh, David, the next slide. So let me share with you, I mean, the baby steps we are taking within, within Novartis to to be able to make sense of this capability development. Uh, this is just a pilot. Uh, we, are, we are taking this to the next level in terms of uh, collaborating with various pharmacy bodies and building capabilities to, to drive our key objectives. So we ran something called SSC Pharmacy Academy, uh, uh, for, which is almost a year, a, year, a year program, a modular program. And the, of course, the, it was driven by, of course, need, need, need assessment was done. Uh, where we looked at what are the basic needs of our, especially the community pharmacists across eight key markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, in collaboration with pharmacy associations that are key there. And we are able to understand what are the key areas where we think we can add a value and improve outcomes significantly. Uh, yes, there are three key areas of that model where we deliver medical content. We also deliver non-medical content. And most importantly, as I said, I like the medical quality information as well. Uh, given that pharmacists are really the custodian of drugs and we must be on top of our game every time we come into contact with patients, especially when it comes to drug delivery, uh, drug, drug information services and um, 
uh, making sure that we also store our medication the right way. So when you look at the medical, medical, medical components, uh, we talk about uh, the non-communicable disease, we talk about malaria, we talk about antimicrobial resistance. As I said today, uh, antimicrobial resistance is now the leading cause, one of the leading causes of death. And we really need to stem the, the tide of that because um, uh, given the peculiar situation we are also in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have over the counter usage of antimicro I mean, antimicrobial agent is so very high. And so we, we took care of that in terms of medical content, uh, of having, I mean, uh, looked, looked at the, uh, the overall need uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the key stakeholders in, in eight key countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. We also looked at, of course, within the community pharmacy setting, uh, uh, medical knowledge is not only the, 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 the basic need, they also need other non-medical components. Uh, whether you talk about supply chain, you talk about customer service branding and all of that. So make sure at the end of the day, we have an holistic educational program that's gonna deliver the right solution uh, to the patient. And most importantly, we talk about medical, medi medication quality, where we talked about counterfeiting, we talk about good distribution practice, we talk about medical education. These are all the three areas where the, uh, the, the, the programs, the educational program actually focused on. And we're able to deliver on this within, uh, this, a lot of modules were delivered over a period of one year. Uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, we, 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 we deliver significant impact. Uh, basically, whether in terms of the knowledge gain, uh, whether in terms of uh, the number of even um, um, stakeholders or the number of pharmacies that actually passed our post-assessment, uh, um, post-assessment uh, questions and there's been a lot of feedback from our from our cluster colleagues or the country colleagues in terms of an improved engagement in terms of um, uh, uh, patient intervention across key markets and so uh, uh, the, the, as I said, the, the collaboration was the pharmacy association with Akivia and we're able to so this is our first baby step to understand fully whether this kind of educational programs will deliver impact uh, we are trying to repackage this kind of uh, education based on our learning and make sure that we broaden our network of stakeholders that is going to collaborate with us. And we want to, I mean, go a little bigger on this capability development. And as I said, our vision is to make sure that we collaborate with the key stakeholders, especially that are working at that grassroots and working with pharmacy, uh, pharmacy associations and the, uh, the key community pharmacies associations across Sub-Saharan Africa to deliver on this mandate. So the next slide, uh, David. So when, when you look at, I mean, how do we see this going forward? Uh, based on our learnings uh, from the SSC Pharmacy Academy, uh, this has inspired our collaboration with Commonwealth Pharmacy Association. Today, we have signed an agreement with Commonwealth Pharmacy Association to train pharmacists across Sub-Saharan Africa. As a matter of fact, I think uh, that, that, uh, that program is live, uh, I think, at, in Q4 2000 2021. And there is a multi-year educational program that we have just signed with community, I mean, Commonwealth Pharmacy Association to take this further. Uh, the the SSC Pharmacy Academy was actually uh, um, the foundation and we have built on that to now package all of these in Commonwealth Pharmacy Association partnership to deliver more educational programs to pharmacists. We're going to mail this and we're going to, of course, it's going to be in collaboration with various pharmacy bodies. At the end of the day, uh, we want to deliver the quality service. Uh, uh, pharmacists play a critical role and Novartis want to take the lead or leadership in this area and making sure that we transform uh, the service delivery at the pharmacy level. Uh, the second, as I said, education is not going to be um, uh, the only thing to focus on for the pharmacists as well as the pharmacy channel. Uh, we are also working with um, like-minded stakeholders like M Pharma. I'm not sure any, any one of us are familiar with M Pharma. M Pharma is building something unique within the pharmacy space. They are gradually turning pharmacy to more or less to primary care uh, delivery centers. Uh, there's a number of interventions that are ongoing there. Uh, we are trying to sign a partnership agreement with M Pharma today. Uh, by Q2 2022, that partnership agreement will go live. Uh, we are piloting in one or two countries. If you are successful in terms of that model, where we can collaborate to provide an holistic end-to-end -end access solution within the pharmacy sector, uh, ranging from uh, education to patient support program, another intervention that is gonna make sure that this role, this unique position that pharmacists play within the healthcare system can be further enhanced to improve on our healthcare outcomes. Uh, at the end of the day, our vision, as I said, is to position pharmacies as a strong channel for primary healthcare delivery, because we know uh, this is gonna support us significantly not only to reduce the incidence of very advanced diseases. We all know today 
whether you talk about breast cancer, a number of our patients are coming into the into care at a very advanced stage. Whether you're talking about hypertension, a number of our patients are coming into the center, even the first, the first time they know they have hypertension is when they have stroke. Uh, or a number of them, name it across all disease, uh, across all, all multiple therapeutic areas. So if we are able to strengthen this important channel or this important segment effectively, we believe that we'll be able to deliver the right information and the right service to patients. Uh, so in a nutshell, those are a few words that I just want to share with you on how far we have gone and how we are taking this to the next level. Uh, thank you so much. And um, we'll be up to uh, wait for questions and comments and interaction with the overall audience. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Ole. And thank you for the wonderful presentation and the pointers on the key interventions you're driving and looking at from an artist's perspective. And it's a critical bit for us to acknowledge that the different stakeholders and they all have their strengths and capabilities which they can leverage on and ensure we drive a common agenda to ensure patients have the best access they need. And that is key. So I'll urge each, each and every one of us, please share your questions on the chat box. We'll have a session to answer them and to respond to them. And Wole is also available to respond to such questions. As we move forward, I'm honored to introduce the next speaker for the day. That is Dr. Nihal Shah, who is a pharmacist and the CEO of BioDeal Laboratories Limited based in Kenya. And he has spent the last 12 years developing the company into the WHO GMP compliant facility through capacity and capability development of quality management team, systems, processes, and infrastructure. And he has worked as a consultant in different capacity and as a pharmacy manager as well. His specialties are in strategy formulation, management and business development, including people development, marketing, clinical pharmacy, and community pharmacy management. And as I hand it over to Nihal, what are, one of the key things that I just wanted to highlight from his bio is the fact that he has a focus. If you look at the first statement, he's focusing on the people. Unless we focus on our people, they are not able to deliver on those solutions. And with the people, we need to have systems and processes in place. And then we give them the right infrastructure to achieve those changes. And I'm hoping from his presentation today, we'll identify the key drivers, the key things that we need to ensure the African pharmaceutical space is not only left for what we can call maybe mediocrity, but we want to be the best version of ourselves. So welcome, Dr. Nihal. Let's carry on from there. Um, thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon. Uh, good morning from wherever everywhere, everybody's joining. Um, first of all, let me just say this is an, uh, an amazing initiative by the APN and uh, to combine, uh, collaborate with Empower School of Health. I think this space has been lacking. I've been thinking of doing this for a few years now. Uh, well, obviously, we're busy in other things. And I think uh, the, if the strategy and the vision is right there, I think this can become a really powerful network for collaboration um, and uh, knowledge development and really standardization of systems and uh, processes across Africa. So congratulations there. Um, Thank you also, uh, Dr. Oluwole. Uh, I don't think a lot of the things that I was going to say, actually, he has already said them <laughs> as far as the clinical and community pharmacy goes. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time on that, but more I'll, I'll come back to my points on how we created capacity and capability uh, to work towards uh, a GMP um, facility. So first of all, uh, Biodi Laboratories, who are we? Uh, we're family-owned, second-generation family-owned uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing company. We're based in Kenya, and uh, we export currently to seven countries as of this morning. Hopefully this year we'll add uh, countries nine and 10. We've just signed some agreements in DRC and Ivory Coast, um, but our seven countries are mainly uh, the East African community. If, but even though we do export a lot out, still 90% of our turnover uh, is within Kenya, Kenya being the main major market for uh, pharmaceuticals um, for that. And we manufacture our own brands. Uh, we don't do contract manufacturing uh, so far, uh, simply because everybody in Kenya actually has run out of capacity and everybody is actually increasing uh, their capacities to supply the region. Uh, when, uh, before, prior to my position here, I was, uh, I, was, uh, I studied my pharmacy in the UK and has worked there for seven years. So a lot of what Dr. Ajao said is what we were doing in, in, in the community pharmacy 
And when I graduated, it, it was an interesting time because pharmacists in the UK were now told we need to start shifting. And this was in 2001, 2002. We need to start shifting more towards a clinical pharmacy, even though you're community pharmacy, not just hospital, simply because to take the load of uh, GPs who are overburdened at the time. Also to, uh, to create direct access to first point of care on minor ailments and um, small uh, drug management, smoking, obesity. So we, we were actually trained in all this. And the thing about that capacity development within the UK and what I'm seeing now with hindsight is that there was a vision. There was a vision for the pharmacist. What is the role for the pharmacist? And the pharmacist association and all the stakeholders got together and said, our vision is how do we position pharmac pharmacists within an evolving, a rapidly evolving healthcare system uh, within the NHS? So all these things came about that we can actually call up the doctor and say, you can't prescribe this, you can't prescribe that. Formulary pharmacists start becoming the norm. Uh, pharmacists in GP practices, advising and working both with doctors and nurses, especially on eczema care, respiratory. I did a lot of that, those two, um, uh, those two kind of cares. And what I saw Dr. Ajao speaking, I mean, Novartis is spearheading all this. But what I'm seeing is lacking is that a lot of that should be coming from our universities. The universities should be creating the competencies, especially on our basic uh, drug problems. I mean, NCDs, antimalarials, these are the skills which the university should uh, empower us with. And Novartis can build on that and other companies are building on that, but really these are some of the basic skills where we have to build a lot of capacity, a lot of capability so that we can understand not just the problems, we understand treatment managements. Uh, so many times I, my, my sales guys will come in where my doctors have written, you know, just for something simple, a penicillin injection, a cephalosporin injection. Oh, and by the way, let's just put in a core moxiclef tablets also, just in case if I've missed any little bugs in there. So you're seeing there's a lot of misprescribing in Kenya, and I'm sure it's the same is happening across the, con across the continent. And when you get this misprescribing, you're getting lots of side effects. It's very expensive for patients. Patients end back in the hospitals with stuff that they didn't need to go in with, right? Uh, so this is something that, again, in the UK, we were trained and developed to make sure the doctors were prescribing right, um, the formularies which were created for that, uh, and of course, anti, uh, you know, antimicrobial resistance, a huge, huge topic, and this is somewhere where pharmacists can actually come in within this uh, pharmacy management, and that's what we were trained initially. So that was where my clinical pharmacy, community pharmacy management took off. And when I came back, into, and the, but I decided to come back into to Kenya because I saw that there was a developing market for manufacturing. I saw the manufacturing space was expanded. My father was already in the business. So I said, using the um, uh, experience I gained abroad, I want to come here and make a difference. We want to make a difference by ensuring that we provide quality medicines, affordable prices, make sure that we make patient compliance packs where possible, um, make sure people understand what they're taking the medicines for and a lot of our marketing uh, messages around that. Okay, So, so that's, that's where we started off from. And when I came here, I saw that there was a massive gap. A lot, most of the companies in Kenya, and there's uh, 38 to, as of today, uh, manufacturing companies in Kenya. In 2010, um, 2009, sorry, nobody understood fully what WHO GMP meant. So, and I was like, even I don't know. And I went to see factories in India, I went to see factories in um, Europe and factories in Kenya, just trying to understand what is this, this, this whole thing called uh, WHO. And luckily, UNIDO and GIZ were also exploring, uh, GIZ is a German uh, development agency and they do capacity building. And they were asking the same questions with 34 companies. Why is nobody manufacturing HIV drugs? Why is not, nobody making anti-malarials in Kenya? Why is nobody doing anti-TB drugs? These are the big three that Global Fund wants. And in 2012, almost $1 billion worth of anti-malarials passed through Kenya. And not a single one of them was manufactured in Kenya. So you can imagine the huge opportunity which Kenyan manufacturing, African manufacturing lost out. Uh, this was through the Clinton Initiative, but the manufacturing should have been done here 
but we couldn't get into that market. We couldn't get, we can't get into global fund market. Today within East Africa, there's two companies which are serving this particular market and the global funds budget is I believe 5 billion or it might have increased to $7 billion every year. So this is where without quality, we cannot enter or take a bite out of this market. And that's where we started working from. So the first thing was to asking, what is it about WHO that we require to know about the GMP? And uh, they kindly provided us some training sessions, which was great. Training is great. Everybody loves training. The application of it was zero. Not just my company, most of the companies. Application was zero. So it meant what I had to do was take it step by step, step by step. People get scared by this. I remember I had an intern who had come in and I was just discussing with her the water specification. And she just shut the book, the water specifications, called the driver and said, I'm leaving. This is too much for me. I'm walking out. So that's, that's great. And we said, okay, if, that's, if this is how the pharmacists, some of pharmacists want to do this, some pharmacists don't want to do this, we need to look for the right people. Who has got the staying power? Who's got the endurance to understand? Um, I don't know, we must have got 1800 SOPs currently in our, in our uh, throughout, throughout the company. And how do we develop it? So we worked with uh, uh, Dr. Eric, who is currently with Norbrook. We worked together to, and just take it step by step. What does this mean? And we used to ask and we used to develop. Once we develop, we need to roll it out to people. Initially, it was quite re remote and everything. Thereafter, we started doing job descriptions. Thereafter, we started saying, okay, training is good, training is good. Now show me through performance evaluation, how do we develop the capacity, capability development of the people in my company? After 10 years, we achieved a team who, are current, who is currently, he started off as a QC analyst, is today he's a production manager. The QA manager is a QC analyst, also become the QA head of compliance. And it's a matter of working through teamwork. It's a working through um, empowering my people, empowering able to see the processes. We sent them to Germany to have a look. Hey, this is what Bayer is doing. Let's have a look at this. What are they doing you differently that we're not doing? And you know what? We found that we are doing the things exactly what Bayer is doing. It's just that they're doing it smoothly. We're doing a little piece here, a little piece there, a little piece there but we have to bring it together. And that's what we're currently working on, bringing everything together to become a WHO GMP compliant facility. Um, so this was, this was how we're developing the capacities of the pharmacists. Of, uh, we also, within industry now, more and more, we're using more uh, Bachelor of Engineering, uh, microbiologists, chemists. These are the guys who are taking up a lot of the workload as well, because simply because as it's becoming more and more specialized, we're finding analytical chemists are best for analysis. Industrial chemists understand the engineering and the processes, and they bring the two together. And then the people together, again, training the people, uh, motivating them. And we're, we're now getting somewhere, um, somewhere that the company is now uh, sort of snowballing into that. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is that Capacity building for me sounds like efficiency and efficiency within a system, within a country. And with what I find it is that the efficiency is based actually on how competent a person is or how competent a company is. And that is through capability development. So for me, those are the three C's, which actually capability developments at the bottom. And I believe here, universities have a role just before COVID, we had an MOU signed with Kenyatta University and JKU at. Uh, unfortunately, as we, as we agreed the date, COVID is hitting, so we have to, uh, we have to um, reinitiate the MOU. But the MOU was basically taking, saying, hey, we're going to take interns. We're going to take interns. We're gonna, we've created an internship program, specific, dedicated, step-by-step -step program for one year. We pay our interns. Uh, Kenya also has a has a system of refunding us through the National Training Institute. They can refund some of the money back to us, so it, help, so it works a little bit. But it also allows us to create a pipeline of potential recruits. And, and that's, that's very important for us because, uh, again, working at global level, 
you often find this whole pool of people who don't understand what you're doing. To come to pharmacists cannot just come in and understand what to do. In fact, the QA program that we've developed right now is one and a half year long as a minimum. And if you compare that with Germany, which has a seven year program before you can put a word Q after your name, QA, and you have to sit through various exams. The UK has a five, I believe seven years, and then, then you have to sit for an exam. So we've just created a one and a half year program, which might not, which might not be ideal, but it's a start for us. Uh, and that's where we're starting to recruit so that we can expand. Um, right. Uh, finally, um, I think, you know, the one of my MBA thesis, uh, I did my MBA at Imperial College, one of the thesis was actually building competitive advantage of an organization through capacity and capability development. And basically, uh, it, it comes from being able to take your resources and bundle them together in a unique way which your competitors cannot copy you. And the greatest resource that we have is always people. So that's what I'm always looking at. How can we take people? How can we form teams? How can we develop potential? And that's where we are now. We now have a management team of almost 15 people. They're doing the day-to-day -day work and that's why I can spend two hours here today. Um, and then who are developing uh, 250 other people, uh, employees at all different levels. Uh, and finally, I think one of the things that COVID showed us is that now more than ever, there is massive emphasis and spotlight on manufacturing in Africa. Not just manufacturing, but how can, I, how can a manufacturer in Kenya get its goods across to 55 countries? That's one of the things that we've actually been discussing with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. We've entered into a partnership where they are coming in and going to develop us further and give us access to more. And hopefully we can find a way of getting access to more and more markets. And this is so you can see that, again, in, for us to be able to do this, we need to develop people. But people also need to come developed into the industry. Um, a lot of people come in, uh, pharmacists especially, unfortunately, I have to say this, but they do come in expecting it's all going to be cushy, it's going to be easy work. Actually, it is. Uh, there is no eight to five job here. There's eight to six, eight to seven. We work for inspections. Inspections go on till 11 o'clock at night sometimes. Uh, that's the way it is. But that's where we are now. And um, through this uh, whole process, we've unlocked funding for more training through the GIZ for the entire industry. And uh, a lot of them, those who participate, are seeing the benefits of this uh, uh, capability development. So I think I'll stop there now. I'm sure there's more stuff I can talk about, but I'll let the, um, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nihal. That was a wonderful presentation and you're looking at it from your experiences and giving accounts on what advances you've noted. And some of the things that actually, as I mentioned about Africa Pharmaceutical Network is in terms of how do we share policies based on best practices? And those are things that we can already pick from here so that at the end of the day, we are practicing from a point of competency, but then that competence is translating into policies and principles that are guiding the industries. And one of the critical bit that I also want to acknowledge at this particular moment is the fact that you've highlighted the opportunities. There's a huge market in terms of the pharmaceutical capacity within the African continent, and those opportunities need people to be able to deliver on them. And these people have to be qualified and competent enough. So how do we ensure we build these competent competencies? And that is one thing that I acknowledge that now from such kind of in discussions and in engagements, we are going to look at how do we build those capabilities and what place do you occupy as a stakeholder within the African pharmaceutical network generally? So I'm hoping we'll make the best of these opportunities and engagements and moving forward, we'll make a better contribution to the African landscape in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you so much for that. So I still urge you again, please share your questions on the chat box. I'll go to the last speaker for the session. So I'll invite Professor Andy to take over from here now. So okay, Professor so Andy, I'm... yes, okay. Okay, then I'll introduce myself. I'm a Professor of Public Health and Director of Training at the Empower School of Health. Uh, I'm so old that I've worked for nearly 40 years in this profession. I'm one of the original authors of the Yellow Book, which many of you will know for Managing Drug Supply, the original edition in 1980, and of course, the latest revised online editions that we have now, as well as the Managing Medicines and the e-handbook for health managers. Uh, I have worked in Kenya 
although not for many years, and I have undertaken many donor-funded grant aid projects. My particular expertise is healthcare supply chain and especially essential medicines for neglected tropical diseases. Most recently, I authored the COVID supply chain and essential medicine training programs for WHO, and those are available online, and I'll talk to you shortly about them. I'm going to talk rather fast because I have a lot of slides, a lot of information to get through, but you will receive the slide deck and you can reference all the information from the URL links that are on the slides. Next slide, please. So what is this Empower School of Health? It's basically a university. It's mainly online, but we have a different approach to training. Our role is not to train people, it is to empower people to give them the knowledge and the skills to go forward. And having that different approach makes us a rather different kind of university, a rather different kind of academic institution. It's all about empowerment, giving you the skills to advocate and to undertake the positions. Next slide, please. We have three main focus areas, leadership and change management, digital learning, both undertaking ourselves digital learning, but also assisting many of us to undertake digital learning, especially what we call micro learning. That's having little short bites on mobile phones to keep continuing professional development up to date. And of course, my own specialist area, which is procurement and supply chain management, which I'll be talking a lot more about. Within that, we look at global health leadership, lots of supply chain, especially for COVID at present, new products, because we have nearly 60 new medicines coming through the pipeline. We've had the first new medicines for TB in 40 years coming through the pipeline. They've been so expensive that we haven't used them very much yet, but that's changing. And now opportunities are coming that we have to embrace and look at. And that means massive changes both in the medicines that we use and the sheer volumes of health commodities. COVID has brought that wake up message to us. Massive increases in the sheer volume of health commodities being used. Of course, medical lab and diagnostics training linked together. We can't undertake good diagnosis. We can't undertake good treatment. And then we see increasing antimicrobial resistance. One of the questions already in the chat box is what can pharmacists do about that? We'll be looking at that in the Q&A session a little bit more. And then healthcare strengthening, especially for pharmacists. Next slide, please. We have links all across Africa because we try to develop local capacity. Okay, we're just changing screen sharing, okay? Right, we're trying to develop local capacity. That's it. Yeah, back one, please. Yeah, back one slide, please. Okay, and in that local capacity, it's empowering local academic institutions, schools of management, and other areas in the activities that we do. Okay, next slide, please. Good. Okay, and on the screen is some of the links that we already have in place, particularly in Kenya. They're well advanced as we're looking at master's degree courses as well. Next slide, please. Our advisors are this motley crew, but we also have some quite serious big hitters there as well. Our mentor who makes sure that we keep everything firmly rooted in reality is His Excellency John Crawford, former president of Ghana. In case academics like me become too high flying, it brings us back down to earth on the realities of frontline workers and what they're undertaking and how we go about it. Today is all in English, although I see we have a few Francophone people with us. We do operate courses in French as well. Next slide, please. So what is this competency in pharmacy that everyone's been talking about? As an academic, of course, I want to define that before we start. And really, by competency, we mean three main attributes. You have the knowledge, you have the skill, and you have the ability to do the job. Many people will leave university with the knowledge and perhaps some skills, but not always with well-developed abilities. And that's one of the criticisms that we're hearing about current pharmacy training. It needs to go beyond the current training that's available, beyond the current curriculum that's available. 
And to do that, we need to define some competency standards for pharmacy. And to do that, we may be able to measure things. And in order to measure what we're talking about, we refer to a competency framework. What are all these competencies that you're supposed to have? Next slide, please. Well, why is this needed now? We've been doing pharmacy for a hundred years. We didn't need any competency measurement before. How is it all of a sudden we've got to have all this competency measurement? And I think there are two explanations there. First, in fact, we've always needed the competency measurement. We've always required that as a profession. But there's also been a massive change in the way that pharmacy has been undertaken from the early days where it was really compounding and there was a strong product focus, it was all about the medicines and making the medicines, changing to a more patient focus, but now coming to a services, being an active member of a healthcare delivery team. And as Dr. Shah talked extensively about, that's a major part of it, but also understanding the specializations within pharmacy. It's no longer possible for a single pharmacy to have the entire skill range that's needed. You can't know about manufacturing and quality assurance and clinical team and hospital management all together in one person. Your brain's going to explode. So we are looking at specialization within the profession that's always been there, but is now to a much greater level, as well as recognizing the changing role of pharmacists as part of the healthcare team. That's always been there. What's changing is the recognition that it's there, the recognition that it's required. Next slide, please. And what is this competency framework? Well, there's a number available. Here is an example from FIP, the Fédération Internationale Pharmaceutique, the international body for pharmacists, they put together a competency framework for pharmacists, along with 21 sustainable development goals for pharmacists. It's a very comprehensive and heavyweight document, but it sets the outline. But that's the global outline. We need to look at how that applies to our individual cases in our individual countries. If you're not already familiar with it, the reference is on the screen. Please do have a look at it. it is available to download for free. There's no charge for it. It's worth looking through what are expected now of pharmacists on a global stage. Next slide, please. Well, that's the global one. Here is an example from Thailand of what they expect in their public health pharmacists. And there's really five areas. One is that there's a patient focus, enabling access to services, interacting with patients, dispensing, counseling and consulting, and monitoring. And that's a key area. This question about what can pharmacists do about antimicrobial resistance? Well, in the UK, the district pharmacist monitors each individual physician's prescribing patterns and see who's over-prescribing antimicrobial products and refers that for guidance monitoring what is happening as part of a team, an important function. There's still a product focus. We still have to manufacture the medicines. We still have to buy the medicines. And it's a sadness to me that Africa imports 90% of its essential medicines. Okay, But if we're going to buy them, we need to know how to buy them. And that's a specialist skill. And you're not going to learn that in an undergraduate pharmacy course. It requires special procurement skills, a mixture of specialist pharmacy and management. A community focus, especially for community pharmacy, around health promotion, education, and training. People look to pharmacists as their first point of contact. They can have a major role in education and training if they have time. But that role has been underplayed in the past. We need to allow time, we need to allow resources for that to be developed. And then the healthcare system focus in clinical pharmacy, in information management, in policy and legal practice, and in systems management. 
And too often we're missing systems management, all about management, the combination of pharmacy with management, and especially in my area, procurement and supply chain management. You can't dispense anything if you're out of stock. And being able to undertake supply chain management and effective procurement is a major skill deficiency. Currently, WHO estimates there's a deficiency of 30,000 people in this area. A massive training need. A pharmacy degree alone will not qualify you, will not give you the skills basis for that to happen. It's a very good start. It's a very good activity, but we need to build on that for more. Next slide, please. So how does this work in specific services? And we look at industry, public health, and clinical service delivery. Of course, in industry, we want industrial pharmacists, people that understand about manufacturing, about manufacturing quality control. In public health, people that understand about regulatory affairs and health promotions, and being able to put forward the concept of essential medicines and the public good. And health consumer protections, and then in service delivery, particularly around pharmaceutical care and interacting as part of clinical and medical teams, being based in GP surgeries, being part of a community pharmacist. Different specialist skills across the whole gamut of pharmaceutical activities, some with a product focus, some with a community focus, some with a healthcare systems focus but all requiring personal competencies that you have the skill mix to be able to undertake these. Next slide, please. It's not a little hard to read, but please look at the link. Here is an extract of all the competencies you're expected to have. These are just the general ones. And it goes on for some pages, particularly around that medicine selection. Well, we can't decide who selects the medicine. Well, no, but you can be part of the Drug and Therapeutic Committee that undertakes that selection within the Ministry of Health. You can provide guidance and advice, and you can learn to advocate and promote. And those are skills that pharmacists often don't have and need to develop. And that's where empower comes in. We want to empower you to give the message of advocacy for pharmacy skills, for pharmacy considerations in medicine selection. If you don't have cold chain, why are you still buying cold chain medicines? Why are you still buying oxytocin that requires cold chain when you haven't got the cold chain in many rural clinics? Why aren't you buying products that don't require cold chain because of poor medicine selection? We need pharmacists actively involved in medical selection and in medicine procurement, all across the range. Dispensing, of course. Counseling of patients, yes, of course, but expanded role in that position. Increasingly, physicians don't do that. They don't have the time pressures to allow it. It's moved on to the pharmacist. And of course, healthcare system focuses, particularly around policies and systems. Lots of general competencies. It can appear overwhelming. It isn't. It's just that it comes in a big framework like this, and it needs a little time to consider it. Next slide, please. So what about the pharmacy specific competences for particular areas? And there's different competences for manufacturing and for service delivery and for public health, all requiring specific competences, which will often require additional training beyond a bachelor's degree, beyond a master's degree, in these specific areas. Well, how can you acquire this training? How can you get this training? We're coming to that now, and that's part of Empower's role. Next slide, please. So Empower uses this competency analysis throughout all its training programs. But again, our role is not just to entrain, it is to empower. You're looking at providing this specific information that you need, that you specifically want to have. Not that some distant committee has decided would be a good idea for you, but you working on the job decide, I need to have these skills. How can I acquire them? 
And in one of Empower's specialist areas, which is procurement and supply chain management, we have a whole range of courses. Next slide, please. And here are some of the courses that we have, and they're linked with different institutions around the world. The majority of our courses are online courses. Huge range available. This is only the extract of the screen of all the courses that are present. So inventory management and procurement in public health, careers, financial evaluation, all across different skill ranges. A huge range of courses from 24 months for the master's degree through to two months for some of the shorter specialist courses. Next slide, please. Well, that's, you're talking a good story, Prof. That, that sounds really good, but some of these online courses, we've had a look at them and they aren't that good. And I'm afraid you're absolutely right. A lot of the online courses are nothing more than a few PowerPoint slides put on the internet. That's not digital learning. That's not e-learning. E-learning has to be designed and tailored for adult audiences, for the profession it's undertaking, and in a way that adults can accept. Well, rather than me giving you a lot of propaganda about how good Empower is, what I would say is if you're really interested, take the free UNDP certificate course in Introduction to Healthcare Procurement and Supply Chain Management. It's online, it will take you about two months part-time, just a few hours a week to undertake the course. You can do it in a shorter time if you have more time available, and you will receive a UN certificate course was written by Empower for UN, go and try it, see how it works. If you're happy with it and you really think you've gained some skills, then you know there are real e-learning courses out there which are tailored for adults, which are tailored for your learning style in low and middle income countries. They're not all about how we do dispensing in America and Europe. They're tailored specifically for low and middle income countries, reflecting the reality of your day-to-day -day operation. Next slide, please. Also available, right now, everyone's talking about COVID. Everybody wants to know everything about COVID. Available free online is the course written for WHO by the Empower School of Health on procurement commodities. All about procurement and supply chain for procurement commodities. And if you haven't already prepared prepared a COVID vaccine procurement supply chain management plan, and I mean a detailed plan of how you're actually going to handle the vaccine, then I strongly suggest you take the course immediately. It's available online, it's free, you will get a WHO certificate if you complete the course successfully. So two courses you can try out, really see if they work for you, and if they do, there's lots more courses from Empower to give it a try to see how you can develop your skills specifically for your environment, specifically for low and middle income countries, specifically for healthcare, procurement and supply chain management, not talking about buying railway sleepers or the British constitution or any other areas, it's specifically for your environment. Okay, I've talked a lot, that ends my presentation. I hand you back now to Dr. David. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Andy. And thank you for the wonderful detailed discussion on terms of capacity development that is generally competency framework and looking at it from the perspective of what we have from the FIP International Pharmaceutical Federation and what the general review of what they think would be good in terms of capacity development and it's not about thinking because most of it actually I remember one point we engaged with the FIP and Dahlia is here actually the head of partnerships and portfolio as well in terms of what do they do in looking at what are the competencies that are required so it's important that we look at the competencies and we look at it in terms of what are the needs in that particular market. And that is something that you've iterated and made it very clear. So we are going into the Q&A session. The Q&A session, I'll read the past two questions. What I'll ask is of our presenters to have their videos on so that we have these questions and after that we'll move to the next bit of the session. So in that question, the first one we had, was on what roles the pharmacist will play in cont containing antimicrobial resistance. I think this is something Wale would mention in terms of the Novartis project on working with the CPA in terms of antimicrobial stewardship. 
Yes, David, I mean, it's an important question. Uh, thanks for that great question. They, as I said, um, a report that just came out, yes, I mean, this week that I was reading, that's almost um, 1.2 million patients or people died from an AMR uh, just in 2019 alone. So it's becoming a very topical issue. Uh, for us, three things will be very important, uh, especially from Novartis' perspective, why we are trying to address this. We all know that what are the driver of AMR within Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, number one thing that has been discovered is counterfeiting. We know that the, the proliferation of counterfeited product is so high and the uh, uh, antimicrobial agents, malaria, and um, uh, antimalarials are, I mean, one of the most, most fake products within Sub-Saharan Africa. So you see that a number of patients are consuming substandard products most of the time. Uh, maybe what Dr. Shah talked about around trying to build local capacity in terms of uh, manufacturing within Sub-Saharan Africa, my airports reduce all of this. Uh, but of course, counterfeiting is actually one of the issues and Novartis is actually taking this head on uh, where we have a head of uh, uh, anti-counterfeiting that are really uh, piloting a lot of innovative solutions to actually address it, especially around some of these communicable diseases, uh, anti antimicrobial agents, anti-malaria and all of that. So that's one, uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, uh, counterfeiting is a great, is a great, is, a, is one of the key challenge. And we're trying to address the true innovation and making sure we also put capability as well so that we create this awareness for pharmacists. This is one of the modules that we took during the pharmacy academy to make sure that we create the awareness and the impact of AMR uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa. The second for me is what I what would relate, I mean, points to what we just discussed around capability building and making sure we have the right system and pharmacy, uh, pharmacy, pharmacists actually practice the right way. Uh, when you look at uh, the over-the-counter usage of uh, antimicrobial agent in Sub-Saharan Africa is still very high. Um, yeah, uh, I lived in Nigeria for substantial part of my life, and I know that I can walk into any pharmacy and just pick um, any antimicrobial agent without any prescriptions, right? Uh, maybe it's a little bit different in South Africa, where you really need it, things are more streamlined. But when you look at across the majority of Sub-Saharan Africa, a number of patients stick uh, purchase antimicrobial agent over the counter. This needs to stop. Pharmacists need to make sure that we actually strictly monitor the antimicrobial usage. And uh, as uh, Professor Andy said there, that I mean, even in the UK, we are the monitor people that prescribe antimicrobial agents. And if you prescribe a lot, uh, then, or Dr. Shah, if you prescribe a lot, then you might need to, uh, they need to visit to see what is driving all of this and change that. We don't have those kind of system yet to really monitor all of that. But at the end of the day, we can take baby steps. We are we really keep the pharmacist to fully understand the challenges that we have. Uh, not long ago when a small bug, I mean, if you have just ordinary ball, you can die before the discovery of penicillin and all of that. So we need to preserve these things that we have and we have to stop over the counter usage of antimicrobial agents today. And one key is also to build capability and education among the pharmacist. And the third for me is to build, is to partner uh, we are working with a lot of uh, pharmacy, pharmacy association, pharmacy bodies, to see what are the things at the policy level, at uh, the government, I mean, uh, our, our public affairs department, what can we do at the policy level to make sure that this is actually entrenched and make sure that the prescription right is, I mean, it's, uh, it's observed and no patient walk into the pharmacy uh, uh, without any prescription. And if you are not fine, if you are not doing well in a particular medication, you need to go back, whether you are actually sensitive to that antimicrobial again before you take uh, on to those, those kind of medications. So uh, from most, those are the three areas of intervention we are trying to, uh, we are trying to do uh, to make sure that we stand the tide of this AMR because it's actually becoming an emerging challenge and we need to stop that now before it becomes another pandemic for us. <laughs> thank you so Perfect. much. Thank you so much, Wale. I think Dr. Shah, you have something to share on that? Um, for me, and again, on antimicrobial resistance and what I see every day, when I was also go out sometimes to market or sell drugs, is this misprescribing by doctors? So how are you going to stop that? One of the other things I also see is that pharmacists are not trained, and I speak specifically in Kenya, to, to discuss in a manner with the doctor whereby it's a win-win situation. Usually doctors, what I get the response is, that, oh, the doctor's just going to switch the phone off, not going to talk to me. So there's a really a huge divide between the two professions. And this is where I think uh, going back to the grassroots and encouraging within the university center. Let's take antimicrobial as an example of this case. 
we get the doctors, pharmacists in one room and teach both of them about it. So now the doctors will talk about their problems and issues and as will the pharmacists do around this issue. And I think what we'll see is a lot of collaboration coming up. And it cannot be overstated, the collaboration must be coming through because mm. doctors are prescribing, pharmacists are dispensing. When will the cycle end? How do you stop the cycle? And uh, that's what we see in reality on the ground, which is uh, apart from the counterfeits, uh, also the knowledge about prescribing. Uh, Kenya used to have formularies, Ministry of Health used to uh, present formularies. I've not seen them coming out in the last 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, we, they had good antimicrobial policy, they had good HIV policy, what to prescribe mm -hmm. when. But I think in HIV, it just it's going too fast for them to keep up with the uh, prescribing itself. But still, the training at university level must go on. And then again, the associations are not picking this up to say, hey, how do we work with the doctors across uh, multi, across functional teams, across healthcare systems? And he spoke about that. How to establish that? And that is one of the key things. It, it won't happen to overnight. It will take three, four years. But it's a key thing that actually needs to be emphasized. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. The key bit on, in that kind of the, your response is, is that at the end of the day, we have to identify the contributing factors. When we look at counterfeiting as a contributor, how do we address that? Irrational prescribing, irrational dispensing practices. And then for us to address all these challenges, we have to share that knowledge, information. And that is what Wale was bringing in terms of capacity building, enlightening you to know these are the contributing factors and this is how we need to address them. And once we identify those, then I can remember actually there are some pharmacists in the Kenyan context who are driving antimicrobial stewardship program at the Kenyatta National Hospital. We have Dr. Iwak and Dr. Kinodia Rosling. They have been critical in terms of how do we intervene in designing the policy frameworks from antibiograms. Anti We're looking at the point prevalence of infections and the point, use, point prevalence in use of antibiotics. Then can we channel that to ensure that at the end, end of this continuum, we are using the most effective antibiotics? So as pharmacists, and there's so much that we can do, we have to look at it from those frameworks and address the needs in our communities where we operate in. And that is a critical bit. I don't know if, Andy, you had something as well on that? Uh, well, I can talk for hours on antimicrobial <laughs> resistance, as you might imagine. Uh, there are many simple things we can do. Often people seem to think we can't address it. We can't do it. It's just too big. It's too much of a problem. The clinicians will never listen to us. That's not so. There's a lot we can do straight away. Uh, we talk about counterfeiting. Um, I prefer the new WHO to um, fake because counterfeiting can sometimes get confused with trade naming. So I'm going to say fake medicines and substandard medicines. There's lots of new technology. The handheld Raman infrared can scan medicines at port. Yeah? It could be used much more. It's only just a rough scan, but it will stop the very worst of the fake and the substandard medicines, and that could and should be used a lot more now to clamp down on that. The problem is the whole issue of regulatory enforcement is a Cinderella activity. We're starved and kept in the ashes <laughs> and treated badly. And until that changes, I'm afraid we got to keep striving with what we've got. But don't be overwhelmed. There are things we can do now to address antimicrobial resistance. That's enough from me, I think. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andy, for that. So that brings us to the end of the first question. Then the second question that I just got from the chat was, do you delegates feel that this is a year, this year a proposal for essential manufacturing and production processes and models, that is high resolution and essential tech transfer for essential medicine, may be an initiative that global health bodies may raise to define, describe in detail and promote and establish just as the essential medicines list is a mainstream narrative in global health. So it kind of, I think this is related to GMP, quality manufacturing processes. And I think the best person to start us off on this would be Dr. Halsha. Um, yes, I mean, this agenda is not just this year. This has been going on for many, many years. Uh, in 1995, I was not here, but my father was here and there was a Commonwealth, uh, uh, the Commonwealth, um, uh, sort of the, the body of the Commonwealth had a massive uh, meeting in Zimbabwe uh, to address the HIV epidemic. Uh, nothing much moved from there, but the problem never went away. Uh, and this, a lot of the issues are stemming from HIV. Why can't Africans produce HIV medicines for Africa, TB medicines, anti-malarial medicines, 
they are no no more difficult to produce than paracetamol or metformin or any of those products. Um, the pro so we are already looking into that, and that's how the Kenya GMP roadmap, which was the first on the sub-Saharan Africa, came about. This was in 2014. The Kenya pharmaceutical sector, which meant that government um, regulatory agency and the industry uh, was brought together by UNIDO. And the GMP red roadmap is something that we're still working on. Um, we're also asking the PPB, the pharmacy board, to continue doing that. A similar program uh, based on the success of Kenya was then started in Ghana and Nigeria. I think the Ghanaians are still continuing doing it. So, in, so there's a roadmap, there's a framework. Um, most of the industry companies who have participated in this, they know what the standards are, the bare WHO standards. There's a lot more after that, but at least bare minimum is there. Uh, I would say at least 15 of the 38 companies in Kenya have achieved that standard. Um, and there's a lot of essential medicine now. So what we're now talking about is not just quality, but also capacity. Can we supply KEMSA? Can we supply in the region to a lot of other bodies? So in terms of essential medicines, again, uh, the UNECA, um, through an expression of interest, chose Biodi Laboratories to work with them to, so that we can now scale up to uh, you know, create more access to medicines across, um, across Africa. And this was under the maternal and child health uh, essential medicines. So that it's not new, it's, it's building up. And what we're seeing now is that the, the momentum is taking off. And we're talking of competencies in that, is that this is where we're now we need a lot more pharmacists coming in, a lot more engineers coming in, a lot more um, chemists coming in, and they're all working uh, together as a team, collaborating to make sure the GMP is uh, and access to medicines uh, enhanced. Sure. Thank you so much for that. And actually, when you look at in terms of the competencies in driving development of the local manufacturing industry, there's the pharmaceutical manufacturing plant for Africa, and then the East African pharmaceutical manufacturing plant as well. And when you look at both plants, one of the key challenges that are being acknowledged is lack of human capital in terms of the human resource. Do we have competent people to drive this growth in the industry that we're expecting? Because at the end of the day, we'll need quality assurance people, quality control. We need supply chain people. We'll need people who are company pharmacy looking at the regulatory components. So these are shortfalls that are being noted. And at the end of the day, as much as we're looking at the policy imperative, what are the need areas? And as you mentioned it in terms of HIV, the global health challenges generally, malaria, the burden is high in, in Africa. So how are we admitting these needs? So those are critical conversations that we need to look into. I don't know if Andy or Wole has anything to add on that. Uh, okay, I mean, I think I've been involved in uh, at least three major initiatives to promote pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa in different parts of the continent, uh, and all of which have sadly petered out. I think we, tend to overestimate the challenges that on a technical sense. They're difficult, but they can be overcome. The skill mix, the business drive is there in Africa. What is not there, I'm sad to say, is the political will to buy local medicines. And until that is generated, I can't see a success for the industry. There needs to be a major change. Fortunately, COVID is driving that change. COVID has exposed the massive fragility of the global health supply chain. I'm sure before 2010, none of you had ever heard of Wuhan in China. You know it now as the place where the epidemic started, but you don't know that they manufacture 40 to 50 API there. And India imports 70% of its API. So when the pandemic hit, Wuhan was in lockdown, no API, no manufacture out of India the whole of the global essential medicine supply chain was disrupted. And that should have been a massive wake up call to the decentralization of manufacturing and the use of local procurement and suppliers. And I sincerely hope we can drive that message home to finances and policymakers in government and in agencies. Mm. I have reservations, but without that, I think the process will not be a success. The technical challenges can be overcome, as difficult as they are. But this political challenge to move the mindset away from this kind of fragile supply chain needs to be complete. Okay, enough from me. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Andy. We need to create a market for the supplies. Wole, you have something? No, no, yeah, I just want to, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with the comment for Prof and uh, Dr. Shah there. Uh, for me, it's just a matter of time. I mean, we, we will do this in, in, in Africa, uh, especially with what COVID has created. There's, I mean, vaccine nationalism is all over the place today. And the number of countries are now looking in what, how do we build local capacity? How do we, I know you know Novartis, I mean, uh, given that our mandate is also to drive uh, patient access. And we know that we cannot achieve it uh, without really building local capacity uh, of, 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 of key industry players to be able to uh, uh, be self-sufficient in uh, uh, medications and uh, medication supply and all of that. Uh, today, there's a lot of pilot going on in terms of voluntary manufacturing uh, and a voluntary um, uh, a partnership where you can release your, uh, your patents and uh, those, can be, uh, those can be manufactured in other countries. Uh, there's a number of things being done and around Glivec and, and all of that. But let's see how that goes because I know that uh, uh, it's a matter of time. I think it's taking time. It's taking some time to achieve this. But in no distant time, with what they have seen with COVID, uh, this tech transfer will happen. This capability building will happen. And um, we cannot achieve much if this is not happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm sure it's a matter of time before we achieve this. Uh, COVID has exposed a whole lot of things. And I think sure. we'll get there very soon. And I agree with you Ole, on that, because at the end of the day, now even from when we look at importing, the supply chains have been disrupted. So how do we ensure our sustainable supply chains are resilient and able to respond to the needs in the market? So that is driving local development and I'm hoping that market will be created. So we are getting short of time, but I have to take the last question that I, I had already captured here. This was a comment that somebody saw, saw to your comments in terms of what about community pharmacies embracing digital healthcare services? So what are your comments in terms of leveraging on digital ecosystem for community pharmacy? Just a brief comment from any, both of you. Wole, from your end, I think you deal with community pharmacies a lot. Okay, so for me, I mean, the number of intervention, as I said, uh, we, we are working, we are partnering with M Pharma. M Pharma is building a very strong solution for pharmacists. Uh, there's a number of digital solutions that have been in terms of data gathering, in terms of uh, making sure we have data to, we have a digital channel to deliver education in a smart way. So even, I mean, deliver patient education and patient support program in a smart way. And so mm -hmm. there are a number of solutions that we are trying to pilot in this channel. If you are successful, we want to scale this further uh, within, the, within the community pharmacy setting. Yes. Uh, we, can't, we can't do without uh, digital channels, given the, uh, the limited number of healthcare uh, providers or even pharmacies that we have. So we can only leverage on technology to be able to bring more and more patients uh, to care and to be able to connect more and more patients to pharmacists. So there are a number of solutions that are being piloted, either around uh, patient education, either in terms of patient support program, or either in terms of even service delivery and medication availability, and even counterfeiting, as uh, Professor Andy said, uh, there's a number of solutions that we're also piloting around counterfeiting to be able to detect it right at the pharmacy level. And so I'm sure all of this will come to fruition. Maybe by the end of this year, some of those solutions will be able to scale them uh, to be able to improve outcomes within the pharmacy segment. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Any comments, Andy or Nihal, before we move to the next session? Uh, I, I would speak for an hour, so I'll refrain from any further comments. And <laughs> just to say, there are digital solutions available, and micro learning is a key feature of that. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Nihal? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good for now. Thanks. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for that. So, as we move into the next session, I'll ask all of you who, and whoever has any more questions, please share them with us on email as I've shared on the chat. And then, one other thing that I wanted to just mention there was that comment, the, the reference document that Wally was talking about in terms of the burden of antimicrobial resistance. I've shared the link to the publication on the Lancet, so you can have a look at it and see from 2020, 2020 that is, and 2021, they're looking at the burden of antimicrobial resistance to have caused up to 1.2 million deaths. And that is based on the analysis on causes of death, the disease patterns, and what are the resistant patterns around those conditions, which would be a pointer to the cause of that death actually. So it's a critical thing that we need to look into and we need to see what is our role in addressing it. So from here, I'll hand over to Sandeep, who will take us through the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David.
Uh, Sonia, are you there? Uh, yes, Sandeep, thank you. I'm here only. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, as I mentioned, that uh, we will be announcing the scholarship program uh, since Empower uh, School of Health is collaborated with African Pharmaceutical Network. So we are announcing one full scholarship and 10 partial scholarship. And this is exclusively for uh, the participants who have attended the webinar today. Um, as you can see, the scholarship is basically applicable for our two courses. The first one is online postgraduate diploma in global health procurement and supply chain. This is a one year course, online course. And uh, uh, the second one is a advanced certificate course in supply chain management of COVID-19 related commodities. This is a three month course and uh, recently added. So as you can see, um, this, this slide is basically referred to the one-year course. The original fee for the course is 2,500 USD. Um, the participant who will be awarded for a full scholarship, the fee will be exempted. Uh, for uh, the rest five scholarship, uh, the partial scholarship that will be given for 1,000 USD. And the final fee that is 1,500 USD that will be the final fee and this can be paid um, in installments also we have a installment program as well and for others who miss the opportunity for applying for this scholarship uh, the original and initial price or for the fee will be applicable uh, this slide will be uh, will be referring to the uh, advanced certificate course which i mentioned that is for three months the original fee for the course is 750 USD. One full free scholarship means no fee will be uh, charged from participant. Five scholarship, the partial scholarship for uh, 250 USD will be given and final payable fee uh, will be of 500 USD. This will be a friend amount as we do not have any installment program for short courses. And for others, the initial fee of 750 USD will be applicable. The process for applying for scholarship, I would say, please get connected uh, with APN um, if you're from a APN. Else you can write to us as well. Uh, my email ID and the department email ID is mentioned over here. That is operations at empowerschoolofhealth.org and info at empowerswiss.org. You can submit your request and you can also, um, uh, for full scholarship, I would request you to please get connected with APN because the for full scholarship, uh, the, the recommendation will be um, uh, forwarded by APN itself. Uh, then uh, selected applicants will be informed about their application and registration process. Uh, the below is the link for the course. Since the slide deck will be shared with you all, you can refer the link or you can visit our website. Please move on to next. Yeah, there is another application uh, process procedure. Uh, you can simply visit our website. You can select the course. You can fill up your application, but do not forget to, because there is a tab where you have to, you know, mention from where you have you are coming. So I would request you to please select APN over there. So we will also got to know that you are, uh, you know, from uh, recommendation from APN and special pricing will be applicable on your um, application. Uh, for as far as payment option concern, uh, the fee can be uh, pay using two methods, uh, online and offline NEFT transfer, bank transfer, and we also have a facility to pay via PayPal online transfer. For partnership, I would request you, if you are interested to get collaborated with us, you can write to Sandeep Verma at partnership to at empowerswiss.org. For uh, uh, enrollments and queries related to course, please write to me on the mentioned email IDs. Now this is time to launch poll two. I would request you all for your participant participation in this uh, polling as well. So I would request the back end name, yeah. So in the same way, you need to select the appropriate answer and later on the results will be shown and shared with you all.
I would request all the members to please uh, participate in the poll. There are only four questions that you need to just attempt it. The first question, as you can see, are you interested in a career in global health for pharmacists? I can see 85% as of now, um, they have mentioned yes. 8% uh, I'm already on it. There are four person who are saying no. Maybe they are from um, different um, background. How did you hear about us from African um, Pharmaceutical Network? 41% uh, Empower School of Health, 20%. Then there are forwarded communications as well, social media marketing. Then have you taken any course with Empower? Not yet, but I'm interested. So please write to us. So we will help you out to get enrolled to the course. And also you can get connected with APN as well if you would like to apply for the scholarship program. How did you find this webinar very useful? Thank you for your suggestion. We will always try to improve and we will be coming with next webinar on the most demanded topic. If you have any suggestion, please write to us so we will organize the future webinar on the topic suggested by you all. Thank you so much. Um, now we are just putting the uh, certificate link on the chat box. I would request all uh, participants to please download your certificate. The certificate will be sent to your registered email ID. If you have any questions, please write to me. Dr. David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you everyone for participation. So as we come to the end of the session, I just want to give our presenters a moment to give us their final remarks and final comments. And we'll close it at that point now. Thank you. So I'll start with Dr. Nihal. Um, no, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I would just wanna say, this is an amazing um, initiative by APN and Empower School of Health. And I think what I've heard, and I'm sure everybody else has heard, is that there's opportunity as pharmacists um, across so many, so across a vast territory. Um, all I can say is really look, uh, you know, uh, pharmacists have to take the lead um, with the vision. They have to develop uh, through their uh, associations, the vision and the uh, practice, the competency framework. It's very, very important that it's done because it sets a set standard which can elevate and empower the entire um, membership. Um, and uh, that's it. I, I'm, I'm really uh, opportun uh, you know, optimistic that this is going to go very far. And I wish uh, everybody the best of luck. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Wole? Okay, there. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, David. And thanks for uh, uh, my other panelists. Thanks for inviting me to this program. It's been uh, uh, a lot of learning for me as well. Uh, three things for me uh, stood out uh, is that, yes, I mean, we are shedding more light on the role of pharmacists. And I think we can overemphasize this uh, because especially in Africa, where we know that pharmacists can play a critical role in addressing a number of our healthcare challenges. And I think this is very important. Uh, we need to keep this conversation going because it's so very important. Uh, if you are able to leverage on the strength and the unique uh, learnings uh, and um, our capabilities that pharmacy staff, uh, we can move ourselves closer to reducing the burden of uh, various diseases within Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and I think, yes, I mean, second one is around that the, the pharmaceutical companies, have, we also have a unique role to play in this area because we can put a lot of stakeholders together to really address this and tackle this head on. And this is what we have started doing within Novartis, uh, given that our mandate is not to leave any patient behind. And I think we want to transform this channel effectively uh, with the support of all the important stakeholders. We want to partner. And uh, we're also looking for a lot of partnership. I just said that, I mean, we are working with common and pharmacies associations. We are looking at people that are doing unique things, innovative stuff at the level of pharmacy and transform this channel effectively. At the end of the day, if you're able to do this effectively, it's going to impact the patient outcomes. Because at the end of the day, patient is at the heart of what we are talking about here. And I can be the patient, you can be the patient, my mother or my grandfather can be the patient. And at the end of the day, if you do this effectively, it's gonna impact everyone 
across sub saharan Africa. So thank you so much. Thank you for organizing this. And let's keep the fire burning. This burning platform is very key for pharmacy education and pharmacy engagement generally. Uh, over mm -hmm. to you, David. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wole. Pharmaceutical industries have a role to play. And the key bit is they're part of the conversation and we're seeing it from this particular level. So let's make the best of the engagements that we're having and collaborate to make pharmacy better. Thank you so much for that, Wole. I'll call on you, Andy, to give your final remarks. Okay, just my thanks to all the participants and to all the speakers for an excellent webinar. We're a little over time, so I won't talk too much other than to say thank you very much for being with us today. There's lots of information available. Please access it, become empowered, and use it. Okay, enough from me. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Our panelists are very able speakers, and the skills, the experience that you've had have shed light in terms of what the global health pharmacy role entails and what opportunities are there for us. For the participants, thank you for dedicating your time for being part of this session with us, being part of the conversation and asking the questions that you've asked. It's critical because it now helps us to probe further and think on what other areas can we venture into? What can we do to ensure that we build the competencies of pharmacists to deliver on the healthcare practices that we need? And as Wally has mentioned, the patient is at the center of everything we're doing. And if the patient is at the center of everything we're doing and we can all be patients at this particular level, how do we ensure we all achieve the successes we want for each other? So let's do the best we can, let's engage, for anybody who is seeking out the scholarship opportunities for the training opportunity with Empower School of Health, you can follow the process that have been provided and you can also reach, reach out to us through Africa Pharma Network at gmail.com. I've shared on the email as well on the chat box. So engage, let's see how we move forward from here. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll hand over to you, Sandeep, to close the session for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. David. And uh, uh, once again, thank you to all the speakers. And uh, so, so at last, I think we are uh, we are closing, and uh, we look forward uh, for a wonderful partnership. And uh, and thank you all. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Have a good thank evening, so everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Take care.